Mark Burris, how's it going? Good, mate. How are you? I'm very good. Like you're a 20 to 30 year old Australian. How do you get into the property market? The, the one factor that's probably going to save everybody is there's not enough property rent. What was your kind of mindset growing up as a kid, just trying to get out of that kind of life? I didn't see myself as being in a situation which was either better or worse than anybody else. Did you supported Canterbury growing up? Yep. Um, so how, why the Roosters? In the 90s, the Super League War started and uh, I was pretty cranky with the fact that Canterbury took the News Corp. How did the connection with you and New South Wales Blues get established? And I basically said, look, I'll pay you so much this year, mm -hmm. more next year, more the year after, yep. but you've got to take the deal now. Here's a check. Coming off second best is just not acceptable. It's literally like there's a death yeah. when you lose. Yeah, it sucks the air out of it. Hey everyone, welcome back to Let's Try episode 25. I'm really excited with this one. Very, very excited with Mark Burris. How's it going? Good, mate. How are you? I'm very good, mate. I love uh, the thing, the jacket you're rocking. You, you like it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? Tell it's, me about it. Oh, it's a bit of a windbreaker, you know? Like, it's obviously rainy outside. And, yeah, it's um, pretty shitty weather. Yeah, but, like, yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the zip and the, all the detail on it. That's pretty full on. Mate, uh, I've got no idea about the design. I just saw it on the shelf and I picked it up and uh, turned out pretty good. Looking like, good, dude. Thank you. I like your outfit as well. Thank you. I think you're always in black, I notice. Yeah, yeah well, I just only because it's uh, I, I can keep things clean um, or it looks more clean. It's probably not cleaner. And uh, and I, I bought this in uh, Vegas, this jacket here, uh, nice. mainly because I went over there and I didn't realise it would be cold when, I, when the footy was on and yeah, I, yeah. it got freezing cold because you're in the desert. At night, it was, like one night, it was blisteringly cold. So I, I, I got this just to – and, of course, I paid too much. I bought it at the casino, Caesars. I bought it at Caesars Palace Casino yeah. um, in the shopping centre there and everything's five times as much as every – but somehow – they, they managed to they – mu there must be something in the air. They must uh, put some sort of drug in the air because you never let, you never get outside the building. Yep. And you're always inside. I got lost in the shopping centre because uh, I was a bit jet-lagged. Got lost in the shopping centre. Ended up buying two jackets, um, paid overs, way overs in relation to the jackets. <laughs> As you do. Yeah, totally. And, but I, at the same time, I thought I got a good, I thought I got a good buy until I got back to Sydney. Then I went, what the fuck? What's wrong with you? Why would you spend that much money on something stupid like that? But anyway, <laughs> here it is now and I'm, and I'm rocking it myself today. Speaking of the smells, but they, they, I'm pretty sure they pump something into the ventilation there. Walls. They used to say oxygen. Yes. But they make the rooms depressing. So I think on purpose, either that or I just stayed at a shitty hotel. But, um, and, and I was at Caesars because um, the, the guys I went with, they were staying there too, but the, the room's depressing and there's nothing in the fridges so that if if you want to drink or bag of chips or nuts or something like that, you actually got to go downstairs. Yes. You can order it, but you would be waiting for two or three hours. Yeah, yeah. So they want you to come downstairs and as soon as you get out of the lift, you're you're confronted with poker machines and everything else. And the whole idea is to get you down there and eat down there and hang down there and stay down there as much as you possibly can. Yeah. They even play games with the, 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 the ceilings downstairs as uh looks like it's a night sky, then they Really, in the middle of the day, then in the middle of the night, actual night, they turn into a day sky. So your 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 sensory system is completely blown away. You don't know what you're doing twenty four hours a day. Imagine uh, while you're drunk. <laughs> like, well, like I was going to say, lucky or don't drink, yeah. because I, I reckon if like that's you, you'd be completely um, bedazzled. Like you wouldn't know what's going on, and you'd be putting money on the table, and that's and that's the whole idea of it. That's why they call it Sin City. I was going to point out, you're out of the sling. Uh, yeah. Well, how did you knew yourself? Uh, I, well, I. I my my good old mate Jeff Fennick uh, really pissed off that I did this, but uh, I promised him I'd stop fighting. And then uh, some cop mates of mine they rang me up and said, "Oh, look, we're back to training. You know, we're just body sparring. You know, come up." And uh, so I went down the PCYC and uh, and I one of those occasions I let ambition get in the way of ability. I mean, uh, uh, the guy was much younger than me, 110 kilos, decent decent boxer, and uh, I just thought I'd just tickle him up, hit him in the liver, and. Uh, he dropped his elbow into my arm and the bicep just snapped off. Oh. oh. There and then. So you get in the ring and get Oh, yeah, get yeah. Down. yeah. Forever. Yeah, yeah. But and then, of course, Jeff saw it. <clears throat> Some boys told Jeff about it and he rang me up and said, you're an idiot. And I am. I shouldn't have done it. Like, if you're going to do that, you've got to do it controlled. You've got to do it with blokes your own age or yeah. similar sort of age, similar sort of weight, et cetera. But, you know, as I said, ambition versus ability, it's a, it's a big gap. You obviously just said boxing. Is that your – Main go to when it comes to sport or working out, like do you keep fit. It has off? been that in jujitsu. Uh, I B like both BJJ? of them. BJJ, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not BJJ. I'm not doing that strict Brazilian jujitsu. I'm doing more um, gi, more gi, no gi, but more um, both. I do both, but uh, more um, uh, MMA version of jujitsu. Oh, yeah. So better, probably better looked at as like grappling. Yes, proper grappling. We, we do that for rugby league as well. Stand up. Yep. On the ground. Takedowns. And yep. uh, you know what I do if I'm in a position. Obviously has jiu-jitsu in it, but um, not pure jiu-jitsu, if you know what I mean. Yeah, gotcha. 
Fun fact, uh, we actually grew up in uh, neighbouring suburbs, believe it or not. Yeah, where were you? I was in Lakemba. You, and you were yeah, in Yeah, yeah, well, I went to school in Lakemba. St. Yeah. John's? Yeah, I went to St. John's. Oh, did you? I went yeah. to Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, that's the same school. Yes, yeah. correct. Well, it's called Holy Spirit now. Yes, yes, yes. So my, my first wife, um, I met her. She used to be at uh, McKillop. McKillop, yes. And that became – the two schools – Combined. Merged, yeah, and she was in the year below me, and uh, and I so yeah, I, that's where I met her at that school there. So, yeah, I, so yeah, that's sort of uh, th is the bowling green still at the back there? Yes, I believe so. I haven't been there in a while, to be totally honest with you. The, uh, the school's completely changed when I was there. Um, yeah, 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 it's massive. Well, it's not not too far from the mosque either. Yes, no, yeah, no, not yeah. too far from the mosque. I think it's like well, probably. A five minute walk, not yeah, even. Five minutes, yeah. I was ten minute walk. I, I lived right on top of the hill on McCourt yeah. Street. I don't know if you know. On the way up towards Canberra. Road. Correct. Yeah. Yes. 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 And the, I used to catch the bus up past there. No way. My my uh, my uncle, um, he used to own uh, in uh, what's the name? Is it, is it Halden Street? What's the street? Yeah, Halden Street. Yeah, okay. yeah, Main Street of Lakemba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where they hold the Ramadan. Yes. Um, my uncle used to own the. He came out from Greece, Mister Penson, and he came out from Greece and. Uh, with my dad and the family, and uh, he used to own the chocolate shop on the corner there, where I used to catch the bus every day. And uh, I was only telling someone the other day that when I used to go there, I used to, he, no matter what happened, um, he would as soon as he saw me at the bus stop, I was like you know, a kid. Yeah. He would call him, Marco, Elodo, Elodo, come inside, and uh, and he would always make me food like chocolates or chocolate milkshake or, uh, but in those days, potato scallops. Things like that, and uh, even if I wasn't hungry, he'd be going, "Fay, fay, 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 eat, 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 eat," and it's a bit of a, it's a European, yes, Middle is. Eastern thing. If you don't eat, you're it's nearly, offensive. Uh, it's you're, offensive. you're offending my our culture. Yes, and uh, eat even if you're not hungry, you still got to eat. What's wrong with you? You're too skinny. <laughs> and uh, I, I was only talking about it some of the other day, but it was so fantastic. You want to think about it in hindsight, like no one would do that today. No one says that to you today. No. Nah. Just no, some random yeah. nephew or whatever. Like, and uh, it's like an obligation for them to call you in and, and give you food. I've got a different version of events that happened to me on Howland Street. Uh, I actually got hit by a car. I was um, just finished detention. And, uh, my dad was running late. And I go, you know what? I'm just going to go up the road and just go to a convenience store. And anyway, waiting for the light to turn green, turn green, crossing the road. And uh, obviously someone driving, didn't see the, the, the light um, and just smacked Not me. Ever. And I... Uh, Fell up, flew, flew in the sky, hit the windshield bonnet on the floor. And uh, thankfully it was okay, but I was so embarrassed. Uh, I just put my bag on and I just kept walking off like nothing happened. Everyone just stopped and like, oh, what's, what's going on? And uh, the guy's got out and he's like, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then obviously people came and stopped him and he tried getting away. And um, anyway, long story short, my dad came um, and he saw what happened. And his mate, first thing he did, ran up to him and he goes, Oh, like your son's, it's okay. Your son got hit. He's okay. But the guy tried running away after my dad heard that. He saw red. You he, he, Against you? Yeah. He's, my dad saw red. Where's the driver? Walked straight. Didn't even come up to me to see if I was all right. Went up to the driver, belted him. And instead of me going to hospital, he sent the driver to hospital. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's my version of it. Old school. Yeah, exactly right. Um, I was going to say, obviously grew up in humble punch bowl. And I'm a big believer in that your circumstances don't really determine your future. What was your kind of mindset growing up as a kid? trying to get out of that kind of life in the, in the upbringing? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I didn't really uh, – I didn't see myself as being in a situation which was either better or worse than anybody else because okay. all my friends are the same. Uh, no one had any money. Um, no one had any things. We might have had a footy or a bike perhaps, but that's about it. None of us had holidays. None of us went to restaurants because mm. there weren't any restaurants. Or there might have been. We didn't know about them. And uh, – so I never really saw myself as different as a kid. Therefore, I didn't have to develop any mindset. It's only when I went to – when I left and I went to university, when I left home and I went to university, mm. that I started to realise that there was – we weren't growing up the same and I met kids from private schools and all that sort of stuff. And I started to realise, wow, uh, there's a big gap between how I live my life and how they live their life. And, you know, they all live near the beach because where I went to university was in Kensington, the University of New South Wales. Yep. A lot of kids from Waverley and Scots College and Grammar and uh, blah, blah, blah. And um, no kids from where I, where I grew up. There was no, no one kid. No, no one kid in my, in my whole faculty uh, that went to school where I went to school. Kids, there were kids there from Ramwick, Marsland, you know, Waverley College, etc. But no one from... Where I grew up, and uh, and I saw the cars I was driving, and I met, got to meet their families. I went to their homes, some of them. I just got to see their, their pretty cool homes, and uh, that's when I started to think to myself, "Wait a minute, there's a bit of a difference the way I grew up to, compared to these mm -hmm. guys." 
and then I, but I wasn't sort of like I didn't have a mindset. Well, I got to get that. Um, yeah, yeah. My mindset was I'm interested to explore this, see how I can get a few of these things myself. Mm. Not really very materialistic though. Yeah, it wasn't a thing for me to have a flash car or. Was it more like, like living comfortably? I, I just, I just more interested what it would be like to have a car like that. I didn't go, should I got to have one of those cars? I, I, I it wasn't. Uh, I must have. It was. I was just curious as to what it'd be like to have one. Yeah. And once I did it, no, no big deal. I didn't care. Because I always took you to be a very ambitious person. Like especially when you know growing up, you kind of wanted to really manifest that reality you wanted to create for yourself. Nah. Um, nah. Nah. Okay. No, I, I wasn't ambitious. Um, probably uh, more curious and ambitious. So okay. I, I was more curious. I'm pretty competitive, um, but I was curious to see what I could explore and what I could change. Yep. And and was I in a position to make change around things that I felt strongly about, like the mortgage industry, for example. But mm. I, I felt quite strong about that because I felt as though the banks had given us a hard time for forever, ever since they existed. So, yeah, right. And I was, my question was, uh, academically, could I, could I make a change in that regard? And so I was always very curious as opposed to ambitious. I definitely never thought about trying to make money. I, I never, it wasn't a thing in my head, how do I make money? Mm, mm. It was more about how do I make change? And then money just came after that. But like, how do I make change? I'm, don't get me wrong, I, I want to make money. I wanted to make money and, and, and improve my, my lot. But no, I wasn't sort of saying I want to be a millionaire or a multimillionaire or anything like that yep. back in those days. Because like growing up in school, like you, you want to aspire to something, right? Like you're told you want you got to get, edu- get a good education, go to uni, you know, be a doctor, lawyer, you know, all those. Me was a sportsman. I gotcha. That was my there my my, my uh, aspiration. Inspiration. Uh, aspiration. I want to be a, a sports person. I want to play for the. In those days, they weren't called the Bulldogs, but I wanted to play for the Berries. Were you ever close to play first grade yourself? Well, I I left at um I left. Uh, Canterbury area when I was 17 um, I was picked for Jersey flag I played SG ball I was best Ferris in Canterbury SG ball what position were you, you I mind? played second back row yep. and uh, what they call back row second row these days yes, uh, those yes. days in lock um, but, uh, and I, I was a decent footballer now the guys I played footy with were all the guys in my class like Graham Hughes and those guys there were a lot of guys played first grade a couple played origin um, so it wasn't unusual for kids in my team to play first grade. Yeah. I played for Brothers. I don't know if you remember Brothers. I played for St. John's. Yeah, I played for St. John's and then I played for Brothers oh, after that. Yeah, so, uh, I think Brothers, yeah, I don't think they're around anymore. I don't they, they, well, bro- well, Brothers was sort of like the, the school, the, the team you went to play f- with after you left school, okay, after gotcha. left St. John's. Yeah. It was sort of like park footy, A grade, uh, B gotcha. grade, C yes. grade, D grade, E grade, F grade. Yes. Yeah, uh, age ways. And uh, yeah, so I played, I played for Brothers for a couple of years um, and then uh, – but then it was just too hard for me to get to university back and forth. To, but training, a bit, mm. the training was at um, sometimes at Belmore. The training was at more more Moorfields Road there, the more more Moorfields Park, whatever it was called there, at the back of the golf course. Um, it was just too difficult. So and then I go, well, I ended up playing for university. I ended up playing in varsity. That was just because I wanted something to do. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I I would love to play. That's what I want to do. I want to be a rugby league player I uh, when that. I was a kid. Yeah, yeah, totally. A proud sponsor, Shoe Grab. Yeah, have gifted you. A pair of dunks if you want to open uh, them up. Yeah, have awesome. a Have a look in there. And I'm sure you'll like the colour, being of your mighty ah, Sydney yes. Roosters. <laughs> uh, these are cool. Yeah. These are really cool. Thank Fast you. Of the show. How good are they? Best sneaker place there is. So these these are really nice. I yeah. actually like them a lot. A lot. How did you get my size? How did you know my size? Oh, don't worry, mate. I've got, I got my tricks. I got that's my... cool. It wasn't Wikipedia, though. It wasn't Wikipedia. I promise. Okay. No. Nah. Thank <laughs> you. The boys at the back Thank told you. Me. Um, that, that's, that's, that's gun. So you, you obviously touched on you supported Canterbury growing up. Yep. Um, so how – why the Well, I moved, I, I moved to these suburbs. So when I was 17 and a half, I moved to Bondi. And uh, and I, was, I just lived in Bondi. And I, I sort of drifted away from footy a little bit. I mean, because it, it just got to bear in mind then um, – I didn't even have a TV. Um, Colour TV hadn't even come out. Shit. Yeah, correct. How old are you, by the way? Am I, how uh, old am I? 68. It's my parents' age. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I didn't... I there was no colour TV. <laughs> so my first TV that I bought, I bought from a, a, a company called Norman Ross, which is yeah. the original Harvey Norman. And, mate, I, and TV in those days used to finish at 10.30 at night. So when the, when the TV turned off, there was just a, a pattern on the TV until the next morning, 7 a.m. or something like that. It was only Channel 10, Channel 9 and Channel 7 and the ABC or Channel 2 it was called. 
And uh, so I couldn't watch footy. There was footy wasn't televised like it is today. There's so many places you can watch a footy. So access to footy wasn't available um, or, or readily available. Um, I was busy studying and doing my work and stuff like that. So mm, mm. I sort of dropped off footy. And then um, in the 90s, the Super League War started and uh, I was pretty cranky with the fact that Canterbury took the News Corp deal. Very upset actually. Mm. And because um, I just thought they're going to ruin the traditional game. And I'd sort of been going out with my mates to watch a few Roosters games because it was just close by. And uh, they were all, you know, guys who grew up in these suburbs. So I all of a sudden started following the Roosters and Roosters st stayed on as one of the traditional clubs. Then I liked the fact that they decided to fight against Murdoch and I could see the, the blue between Packer and Murdoch. And that um, enticed me. I, I just loved the whole idea of the two most powerful uh, tycoons is, in yeah. Australia going head to head. That pretty was pretty cool. cool. So I thought I'd choose a side. So I chose Packer and I uh, chose the Roosters and um, because I was in the Roos area. And then, mm. you know, Nick Politis asked me one time, we were mates and, the, and David Gingell, and they asked me would I join the board. And uh, that was in, I think, the year 2000 or 2001. And I agreed and I've been on the board ever since. I inflicted a fair bit of misery on the Roosters in my playing days, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> I know that. Well, a lot of people do that to us. <laughs> well, you're going good. But, but, but like we do Jesus. hand it back. Yeah, we, that's true. That's true. I yeah, have, yeah. I have Did you play against Morley? Uh, no. Oh, I'm not that old. <laughs> no, I'm trying to work out what, what period now so when Morley played, was, was a crossover. Um, Jeez, from 2012 to last year, that that was my playing career. 2012. Did you? Um, Molly, I know he would have been. He was 2005. Yeah, or yeah, a few, a few years back. Did you um, go to that game at the SFS um, Panthers v Roosters in the first prelim final? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we, uh, you guys got the minor issue yeah. and, we, and we beat you in yeah, like the dying it. minutes. That's probably one of the best games I've ever played. To be totally honest with you, so it was um, so what, I would kick the field goal. Yeah, and who was who was it? Uh, was where was was Sunny Bill? Yes. Yeah, he was playing for you guys then? No, was you us, guys. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 He was, uh, I was playing on the left edge. He was right um, back row, so I was running at, at him a fair bit. It wasn't fun. I felt, I felt to the next morning. And uh, I actually got a special memory, a core memory from him. I used to look up to Sonny Bill. And uh, I was just having breakfast the day after in Coogee and with my wife. And, um, you know, just eating and I saw my wife's eyes and she just looked up like that, like she just saw a ghost. And I'm like, look at her. And I'm like, she okay? And then I get this hand on my shoulder and I'm like, Who's this? And it was Sonny and um, I think it was Willie Tonga. Oh, Re Rennie Matur, sorry. And, uh, but Rennie was, was playing for, for Canterbury. Re nah, Rennie was – oh, Canterbury Power at the time, I think. Right, or, okay. Yeah, and I was like, oh, hey, hey man, how are you? And he's like, played played well last night, man. Uh, keep it up. You're, you're having a good year. I was like, oh, thanks, brother. Thank you, too. And I was just <laughs> – couldn't even finish my breakfast. My business is just looking at me like that. You don't <laughs> realise what a giant is, though. Monster of a man. He, he's really big. Hands all that. Yeah, he's it, – I mean, like, it's really unfair – the physique he's got. <laughs> is it a, It kills me. Like just uh, blessed, right? The guy is like a god. When he, he, like even now, like and he's I don't know, must be in his forties. Easy in his forties. He's he's built like a god. I'm trying to get a session in with him. That'll be fun. Um you spoke about boxing, uh being one of your passions. Let's talk about the Tim Zoo fight. What did you th uh, make of it? Um I was I, I don't want to be one of the lounge uh, chair critics, but yeah. one I think uh I think uh, Fandora beat him legitimately. I mean, he hit him more times. Um, jab. Yeah, just kept jabbing. But yeah. he was also hitting him in bunches. Like he jab, jab. You know, and, and I, I have a feeling it, it was it was a bit more difficult for Tim because this guy was a, a, a left-hander. So, and I think Tim's injury, the way the blood was coming down, mm. uh, assisted a left-hander. It was better for a left-hander. Um, I think Tim was extraordinarily brave and courageous. But I... I and it's all easy for me to say, but in hindsight, I do believe that their, Tim's corner should have um, called the doctor in after two two rounds after the the blood said they should have said, look, it, 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 we can't stop the bleeding, yeah, and it would have been a no, called no contest. No contest, correct. Yeah. That's what I was going to uh, ask you next. I, I just think that's what should have happened. Yeah, okay. but it's easy in hindsight because I actually enjoyed watching the battle because I kept thinking to myself, and maybe this is where their corner was thinking, Tim's going to get him. Mm. You know, maybe Tim can get him. I kept thinking that myself. Like maybe he can get him. You know, and he, but the 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 guy was, the, you know, Fandora is a lot more uh, resilient and tougher than I thought. Um, he he ate a few shots from Tim, quite quite a few shots. But Tim was just hitting him with one big right, like uh, you yeah, know, he, he just kept loading up, being, but, but, but one right. But, but the other guy was going bang, 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 like and just kept putting him away. You know, mm. and uh, I think he legitimately won. Um, I, but I think it'd be a different fight next time, though. Yeah, I agree.
I definitely agree. That's a, that's assuming they have the uh, he has a rematch. I'm hearing there's no rematch written into the contract. I don't I believe hope so. it. I hope so. I think it'll be awesome. But if, if I'm Fondor, I wouldn't fight him again. If there's no if there's no clause, I wouldn't fight him. Yeah, I, I, I don't blame him. What's your take on like all these boxes coming out, like the socialites, like Jake Paul, Logan Paul, KSI? These guys coming out and making multi, like for example, the the Paul and uh, Mike Tyson fight. What's your take on that? I like it, but not as boxing. I like it as a show. Yeah. I'll watch it, um, mainly because I want to see Paul get his ass kicked. But I'm, I'm equally worried that Mike, Mike's never been the, the fittest boxer in the world. Yeah. Like, Tyson was never the fittest fighter. Mm. Um, uh, he was a powerful fighter. And so, you know, he's 58. He's given away a lot of years to a much younger, fitter guy. Um, and by the way, Paul can fight. He's, you know, he's okay. had plenty of fights and he's okay. He's experienced. He knows what he's doing. Um, so, you know, I, 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 my take on it is that um, if Mike doesn't finish off in the first three or four minutes, three minutes or, or in the second round, then Mike's going to have a very hard day at the office. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's going to be a hard one for him. Um, and uh, I just so, – but do I – I don't want it to turn into a circus. I don't want Mike to be embarrassed as one of the great – Great heavyweight. I feel like he's almost ruining his legacy in a, in a way. If if it doesn't go his direction, mm. um, but also you know you got to give it to him. There's probably a hundred million dollars on the table for him, and uh, anybody would do it. <laughs> Maybe you, you both. You and me. I take you, I take the five hundred million. You know, like uh, why wouldn't you? Be, be fun and be fun. <laughs> yeah, true. Be able to say, oh, yeah, I fought Mike Tyson. Like yeah, I mean, it's almost like a death sentence. But when you think about it, <laughs> yeah, no, no, totally. I mean, I, but but if you're if you're um, Jake Paul, like. It, but yeah, I, you would do it because Lucky you're a young champ, guy yeah. and you're fit and he's big, he's jacked. He's you got know, the he's, runs on the board as well. Is that yeah, a few no, fights? No, he's, he's, he, but you, if I was in his position, I'm saying, yeah. uh, not my position, but in his position, I'd probably take it because uh, yeah, say I fought Mike Tyson. That's cool. And I might win. I'm, and if I if I don't win, I'm probably still going to get 50 million. And it was also good for my business because it's just going to increase my base. You know, and more people are going to watch him. <laughs> Well, I'll be watching him for sure. And I'm sure. Yeah, totally. Too. I'll watch. Yeah, hundred percent. Why not? But I, I, but I, but I, but I'm watching Mike train, <clears throat> and I'm thinking so. And what everyone goes, oh, Mike Tyson looks. Like, yeah, but mate, the 15 second, 20 second. Clips. Yeah, correct, <laughs> correct. I mean, Danny Green said to me the other day. He said Mike will not. I was talking Danny. Dan, he said Mike will not get him. Mm. The, the other guy's going to over time. Just, just stay away from, stay away from, stay away from him, and then uh, keep off the ropes, and then Mike, Mike will get worn out. He's 58. Yeah, I know. Well, pretty galley of him to go back into the ring in, in the first place. Totally. Um, I want to talk to you about Wizard Home Loans. Um, what separated you from the rest, um, and especially with the major banks? Well, if we can start with the major banks, um, we our prom promise was that we'll open up branches while banks close our branches because that was going that was through a period where banks were closing down branches everywhere. These days, they still do it much yeah, more, but much more, yeah. that was a new thing. Banks closing branches at the time, so we played that game. We we opened up yellow, uh, we opened up wizard branches whilst the banks were closing, so that was a point difference. Um, we were open Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, so banks were only open Monday to Friday. Yep. We were open; they were only open from nine to three or ten to three. We were open from eight till five, and then we'll come and see you if you want us to instead. So we had a lot of points of difference. Mm. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, second thing is our product, our logo was no judgments, just home loans. So we knew people felt like they were being judged. That you might walk in, you might have a funny colour skin, you might be a single woman, you might be a husband and wife, but the wife wants to get pregnant, but you're relying on both incomes. All of those things are sort of not discriminated against, but uh, were looked down upon by the banking system as such in those days. Um, because <laughs> people were making decisions that you were considered to be a risk. So people felt like they'd been judged. So we ran this program. We're not judging you. We just want to lend you money. Yep. You couldn't do that today because the regulator, regulator probably was, say you're I, trying to give money away. I was going to say you're inheriting a lot of risk as well by doing that. But yeah. Well, you, we didn't really because yeah. cause we still assessed you on a, a normal basis. Okay, but, gotcha. but we didn't judge you because of the fact that uh, you might have been you might have been a wog like mm. I am. Mm, like me. Yeah. Mm. You know, a lot, a lot of times the old bank manager, white guys, the, the local bank manager and, you know, I'm not suggesting this is the case, the local bank manager, Miranda, for one of the big banks, might have been a white guy who's been there for 40 years, might have been a good guy, but he might have had a, a view on, you know, Lebanese, Greeks, whatever. Um, and that sort of shit used to happen. Not so much these days, but it did happen in those yeah. days. 
So the judgment was that we were not going to make a judgment. So most of my branch owners were ethnic, um, you know, or Australians, ethics, whatever. I, I didn't say, you know, there was a particular style of banker I need to have. So that was the point, point of difference is uh, our, our view, our purpose. Um, our interest rate was a little bit less than the banks, slightly less. Another but point of difference? N- n- not, not enough for someone to move. Um, and uh, we're accessible. And we wanted to actually lend you money. I, I feel with banks as well, the last thing you want to do is piss them off because I feel like they're, they're not—it's not—they're not an enemy that you want to have because um, they won't—they won't lose in my in my eyes anyway. So what? How did you keep them at bay? And how did? Well, I, I let John Simons do all that. Oh. <clears throat> so I just took the view. John and I were part of a John, myself, another guy called John Kinghorn from Rams. The three of us were the three big brands: Wizard, Aussie, Rams. And between us, we had like 20% of the market. And uh, at, in, in the end, we had 20% of the market, not to start off with. And uh, I just took the view that I'll let John run around and uh, criticise the banks, say they're ripping you Very off. Very vocal, remember. Let I him remember do it. kid. Yeah, just you go do it, John. John yeah. Go for it, mate. Um, I won't do that because I, I don't want to – I didn't want to be a critical person. Like I, That's not my style anyway. Um, and I, therefore, I wouldn't have been able to carry it off properly. Um but it was enough that he did it because he created a movement. He actually created the movement, not me. He created the movement. Um, I then went and offered, had a slightly different offer to what he did, um, the way we gave access to the pro- product. But I let him do the stuff and the upset the banks. And uh, what was interesting about that, though, is um, behind Aussie Home Loans is a bank called Macquarie Bank. Mm. So John was out there uh, jamming it into the banking system, yet Macquarie – was sort of like his partner. And then after that, CBA bought him. <laughs> so <laughs> obviously he didn't upset the banks too much. Yeah, clearly not. Yeah, because they, 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 they bought him out in the end. How good. Uh, how, how did the connection with you and New South Wales Blues get established? Because I remember as a kid growing up, Wizard Blues, you know, plucked right there in the center of the jersey. What was your strategy behind that? Or was it just for the love? Uh, well, it started off that. Um, but, but if you remember, the Super League War started yeah. and um, – Tui's dropped out in 1996, I think it was. And um, so New South Wales didn't have a sponsor. And uh, by the way, Origin wasn't as popular because the uh, News Corp Super League players did not, couldn't play State yeah. of Origin. So it wasn't as popular. Um, so they had no, no sponsor on Jersey. And uh, I got a phone call from a mate who was working at New South Wales Rugby League. He said, mate, we don't have a sponsor. Um, the game, ga- first game... It's about to be played. It was sort of like a Wednesday. Usually it was Wednesday. I think he called me the week before. He said, mate, you can nick this. You get it really cheap. And I said, oh, really? And uh, I just sold my house. And I had a bit of money. Like, not much. <laughs> a few hundred thousand. But uh, – and uh, he said, like – I said, mate, all I've got is this amount of money. And he said, oh, they won't accept that. So I remember went and saw um, the, the chairman of the uh, New South Wales Rugby League, went to his office, and um, I got a bank check. Before I went in, and I basically said, "Look, I wanted the deal for three years. I'll pay you so much this year, mm-hmm. more next year, and more the year after." Yep. Um, but you got to take the deal now. Here's a check, <laughs> and uh, they needed revenue, like everybody does. And um, I just think it was a, probably a little bit too much for me to resist. The check was sitting there. The money's on the on the table. It was a quarter million bucks, and uh, and he, he accepted it, and. and then I just kept renewing it every year, uh, every three years. I just kept renewing the sponsorship. Overall, over a period, of Wizard did that for ten years. Wow. Yeah, but it wasn't. <laughs> it went up substantially. Yeah. But, but nonetheless, it was a great sponsorship. And I probably, for those people who think about sponsoring teams, I think it works best in the first few years when you're not known. Like, who the hell's Wizard? That's was is a question. People say, "What's that on the jersey there? Like, mm. who, who's Wizard?" Mm. Um. Uh, then after that, I mostly did it just because I, I didn't want to l- stop being involved in the, um, the rugby league. Well, you just, I, just, it creates curiosity, right? I love it, and yeah. I and I just love love the, watching the coaches. And we had, you know, I had, I had um, who was my first our first coach? Uh, Please, we're going back. It was ninety eight. Um, our first coach, I can't remember now. I can't. I'm but then, but I had yeah. Junior. Junior was a coach. Gus was a coach. Yes, Billy yes. Ake was a coach. Sticky was a coach. You know, I went through quite. A, Quite a few coaches it was unreal. Like I got to meet these guys and got to see how they can try to turn players' heads around. Like mm. you know, to, to become 
happy to play for New South Wales. Got to meet the players, a whole lot of players, and you know, made some long lifelong friendships with these guys. And uh, get down the dressing shed, like, well, you know what it's like. But like, the difference between winning oh. and losing in the in the oh. dressing room is especially for Origin. I it just it's like I had no sense of it. It's just I can't explain to your audience, but like. It's literally like there's a death yeah. when you lose. Yeah, it sucks the air out of the room, legit. Yeah. No, everybody's head yep. down and it's not bullshit put on or it is for real because yeah. the players come in, they're exhausted, coach exhausted. But when you win, my God, like it's like, it's, I don't know, it's like the, the most erased el- el- form of relation that the, you could possibly imagine. Yeah. Like uh, the, there's no nothing in between. Well, as a player that's lived it and – it doesn't start from the game. It actually starts at the beginning of the week. Well, the moment you get selected, right? Because it's just such an emotional roller coaster going up and up and up and obviously getting hammered by media. Everything in the paper is about origin, right? Um, you're getting your training and the way we're training, it's like we're training to like we're playing we're training like ninety to hundred percent every single time. We're bashing each other and we're we're, we're training to in a way that we're going to face an enemy that we absolutely hate, right? It's a, so you, there's another level of emotion. And then when game day comes, like, mate, just singing the anthem, like that was another emotional roller coaster in itself. And then when the kickoff happens, like you're just zoned in now, like you're just programmed, right? And because you put so much time and energy into it for that whole week, coming off second best is just not acceptable. And, and, it and well, second best, like, it's, it's like, it's not first and second though. To me, it looked like first and then it's not second. It's like... Mm. So far last, it's ridiculous. Like, fail. Yeah. Total failure. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's like you failed your friends, you failed your supporters, yeah. you failed your coach, you failed your teammate, you failed your family. It's like you've been massive failure. Because everyone, for me, like my friends, family, they all came to the game. They were all, all so excited that I got selected, blah, blah, blah. And as a player, you almost, yeah, like the fans as well, of course. Like, you know, they come in droves and – you feel like you let a lot of people down. Like Origins watched around the whole country. It's a nation, you know, it's probably the most watched sport. It is. A, it, I think it is the most. It uh, is. Outside the Olympics, yeah, it's the most watched sport. Exactly. And it's a lot of pressure. Well, and that that was fascinating to me to sort of have an opportunity to experience that. Or, mm. or to watch Gus, one of the great orators, mm. to get out there and put the hairs on the back of players' necks up. And they feel like they could walk on water after Gus spoke to them. Or watching Sticky the, with his unbelievable intensity, mm. um, sort of talking to the players. Uh, first coach that I uh, sponsored under was uh, Tommy Radonikus. Oh. <laughs> watching Tommy. Uh, then watching Junior. Junior is completely different. Like he's like a psychologist, you know, like he's – and uh, Bellamy, same. Like, like it was quite – I was so lucky. I kept sponsoring because I wanted to experience it. I just loved the experience of it. It was only like a nine-week period, but the experience is amazing. Yeah. And winning. I was, and then the flip well, side winning. winning. Was, uh, Fuck. It's a party for the next two, three if days. If you can win. Oh, actually, funny you should say, because I, I had a coffee with Madge yesterday. Yep. And, uh, you know, who's now the coach in New South Wales. And he's such a researcher and uh, mm. he's so uh, – Michael's so intent – on knowing everything he possibly could know about uh, origin and building his own thematics around it. It's, it's, uh, it was, it's, it's such a pleasure. And I wouldn't have got to meet him unless I'd done the sponsorships. And so I, I guess I'm still getting a little bit of momentum out of all those, that period. I mean, I think we invested over the 10 year period around $10 million mm. in New South Wales, well. rugby league. And, uh, and if, at a personal level, is it worth it? At a personal level, absolutely. One of the greatest thrills of my life. Wow. Wow. Love that. Well, obviously a hell of a journey. Uh, in 2004, you end up selling. Congratulations for $500 million. Well done. Um, you're obviously at the top of your game. What makes you decide, I want out now? It's the right, it's the right time to walk away. Well, I didn't make a decision. It's a bit of a long story. Uh, I should sort of, I don't know if we've got time, but I, what happened was that I used to go and see Kerry Packer every month. Kerry was my partner. I used to go and see him every month. And there was one occasion when I went in to see him in 2004, beginning of 2004, and he said to me, son, uh, how, just take me through this again. How much money do we owe? I said, oh, we owe $19 billion. 
And he said, uh, and he went, what? And he said, how many assets have we got? I said, we've got $19 billion worth of assets too. For us, an asset is a mortgage. Yep. But I lend you a, a million dollars, but I borrow a million dollars to lend you a million dollars. You know, like it's a simple equation. So I have debt a million, asset a million. Yep. And he said, he said, I said, I said, I said so you don't worry. We got, I said, we've got a $19 billion worth of assets. He said, well, hang on a minute. He said, what happens if half the customers can't repay the loan, but you have to repay back all our debt? I said, don't worry about that. I've hedged it. I've, I, so complex, but we had hedging contracts with all these um, international debts that we had. So I hedged everything. And he said to me, who are you hedging it with? I said, uh, major banks around the world. So I have hedging contracts with major banks around the world for currency, for interest rate changes, for all sorts of things, for defaults. I says, we're, we're book matched on risk. I ha we have no risk. I pay for all the risk in a fee and I still we still make enough margin in the, in the loan to our customers to make good money. He said, I don't like it. He said, even someone like me, he said, I'm – if something goes wrong, he said, oh, I'll go broke in his case. He said that 19 billion is more than anyone in Australia ever accumulated in, in terms of assets. Mm. And I said, he said, so we need to, he said, we need to find a, a buyer. We need to look at thing about, he says, too big for us. This business has got too big for us. Yeah, wow. And um, I said, oh, okay. So I didn't give, I, I hadn't even had a thought about selling. Um, but it was sort of more Kerry started to get me to think about it. And then um, we started putting a few feelers out the joint and, uh, you know, GG, who's the buyer, came along yeah. because it, they were looking to get a foothold here in Australia in terms of financial services. So, and that process took seven months. So it wasn't a matter of I decided to get out. It was more Good time. Kerry got nervous. Uh, and uh, in he's hindsight… A he's a bit of a risk… Sorry to interrupt. He's a bit of a risk taker as well, isn't he, Kerry? Yeah, but he's also, he's also very good at reading markets. And okay. he basically said to me, those hedging contracts you have – with those big global banks, if could one of those go broke? And I said, I doubt it. Like, you know, I won't name the banks, but the global banks, one of them did go broke in the GFC. That's what I was going to head to next. Yeah, so he Shit. knew it. Shit. He didn't know it, but he suspected it, and because uh, he didn't, he, he didn't live live through the GFC because you know he passed away before that. But, mm. um, but nonetheless, he knew the possibility of someone actually going broke, and if. It's only a hedging contract. So if the bank can't make the payment, you can't sue the bank if they're in liquidation or gone or gone broke because mm. you just line up with everyone else and then you end up having a problem. And so his foresight was amazing. Um, it was a couple of years early, but it doesn't matter. His foresight was amazing. At least some people are just gifted with that, aren't they? He, he'd been around, he'd seen everything. Yeah. And, uh, and he talks to everybody and he gets a sense, a better sense than I'll ever get. And mm. uh, because I didn't talk to the people, he talked to him. And he, he'd go and talk to Bill Gates or Bill Clinton or I don't know, whoever. Those sorts of people. I, I didn't have access to those people. So, you know, he, he knew what was going on. Yeah, so you said four years later, like the GFC hits. Yeah. Um, so GE decided to sell back the business to yeah. Aussie Home Loans, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, Aussie and CBA. They, so at, that's for a fraction of the price, right? Yeah, well, it, that they sold back for a fraction of the price. They sold back during the GFC. They sold back the brand and the distribution, the footprint for a fraction of the price. The value was in the size of the book, uh -huh. the $19 billion yeah, of assets. Yes, 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 yes. They didn't sell that. Uh, they held that. Uh, gotcha. They just sold back the brand and they sold back and they sold back the distribution, the footprint. Yeah. So basically all that happened was that for, I think, I don't know, $28 million, $30 million, um, Aussie bought back the right to turn all our branches into Aussie branches and also bought back um, – the Wizard brand and CBA still owns that brand today and they just buried the brand. So they took a, com took a competitor out of the market, yep. 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 which is a good, a good strategy, and rebranded the distribution into Aussie distribution. The book itself stayed with GE. Mm, gotcha. And then over time, the branches oh. just refinanced the GE book. Yep. So they would they would say let's say you'd had a wizard loan, um, the the now the Aussie branch would say to you, okay we're going to refinance you into a CBA loan, yep, and then that refinance would go to pay back GE its money gotcha. over time. Gotcha. That, that that was, it was a very clever, bit of financial engineering by John and the CBA guys and James, um, 
and it worked. Well, GFC hits, like obviously no one saw that coming. What was the main denom uh, denominators for that? Uh, so everybody sort of, the, the, these days, all sorts of people take credit for seeing it coming. It's always easy to say, oh, yeah, yeah we knew it was going to happen. Right? Yeah, in hindsight, correct. Yeah. Um, probably it didn't affect us here in Australia other than the fact that there was a flow on effect from overseas. Yeah. So it was really the major issue was that in America, um, there was a lot of liquidity in the world. And when liquidity being lots of cash flowing around, like so people were saving money for superannuation, they put it into a super fund, yep. big super funds over there, massive super funds over there, got all this cash, they got to invest it. Cash is always looking for an asset to be invested in, to buy. Um, one of the things that was really attractive around the world for cash to be invested in was mortgages. Um, and then but because there weren't enough mortgages equivalent to the amount of cash that wanted to be invested in it, they started to say, okay, well, let's invest this cash in more risky mortgages. Like let's, let's lend someone 100%. And it got to a, a stage in Mary where they're lending people 110%. Mm. So you buy a property for a million, do do million dollars, they lend you 1.1. <laughs> 1. 1. And, and then it gets, and so every, this cash was competing for these assets. Mm. So the assets became more and more risky. Yes. By definition, um, there were people there with uh, uh, no income, uh, no income borrowers. So in other words, they were lending 100% to people who didn't even have any income. They're just lending against the asset value that the asset was sense. going to go up. Mm. So by definition, that is sooner, sooner or later is going to collapse. Yeah. And that's exactly what – it didn't that's happen in Australia. No, banks never did that in Australia. No one did that in Australia. We never had what they call a subprime market. It never existed. There, there is what we call a subprime market, but it's not like their subprime market. Their subprime market is lending 110 120% of the value of the property. To people who had no income, mm. Mm. no servicing ability, that has to crash. And that's what happens when liquidity in the world chases down assets, various assets, and the asset they were chasing down was mortgages. So that's what caused the GFC. Mm. That makes total the sense. The collapse of these things. And once the top one collapses, the next one collapses, and it cascades all the way down until it gets down to the prime area. Yep. And, and as a result of it collapsing, Money becomes much more expensive and all of a sudden money, the, the liquidity in the world starts to disappear because people who bought something for $120 now is only worth $70. Correct. I'm a lender. I bought a mortgage for $120, bucks, now worth only $70. i have lost 50 50 has just disappeared from the system. So the liquidity reversed. It started to go down like into a, a, a black hole. And when liquidity disappears from the system, there's less money to lend and as a result you get a recession, which is what happened. Could we see that with the property market currently in Australia? No, I don't think so because the world has changed its view on um, what is appropriate lending rules. So they did learn the lesson from the GFC. So lending rules are significantly different. The only thing that could happen here in – well, the only thing that could happen in the world, not so much Australia, is that the one of the effects of COVID or one of the mechanisms developed nations – used during COVID, including Australia, mm. was governments to print money and throw money at the economy. Yep. Aren't America doing that right now? Th they were doing it, mm. but now they're retracting. So now America is reducing the amount of money into the system, same as we're doing here in Australia, reducing the amount of money in the system. Yep. As you, as I said before, if you take the money out of the system when you're used to having lots of money in the system, yep. it's like having lots and lots of sugar and all of a sudden I withdraw the sugar from you or drugs or alcohol or anything that excites you. Money excites economies as soon as i take the money out and the excitement goes down as long as it, if it goes down really quickly mm. then generally speaking you, ha you get a negative outcome in other words the value of assets yep, uh, yep. We get, we get reduced but it doesn't seem to be happening because we have another factor that exists in the world today and these guys by the way didn't work it out it's, uh, we're only looking at these things in hindsight from an economics mm. point of view of course but the the one factor that's probably going to save everybody is there's not enough property around well, that's what we're doing now. That's yeah, what we're there's not enough property. Mm. And as a result of not enough property, property prices will stay stable, stay high. Yeah. Interest rates are really high. Yeah. yeah property prices are going higher. Yeah. And that, that is a factor of not the interest rates, but that's a factor of, of there not being enough property relative to the number of people. Mm. So, so it's sort of like a, it's, it's only lucky that it happened that way. There's always a global event that really shakes up the world. GFC, COVID, wars, whatever that might be. Can you see something happening in the next few years that might – make drastic change um well I, I definitely think geopolitical uh issues like wars is potentially the biggest one 
that I'm worried about. Like, um, we've got two at the moment. Yeah, we've got well, and we've got two. Definitely got two at the moment. But that I, but I can see the they're sort of fairly contained within the Middle East. But if that gets bigger, if we start to have more drama with Iran, more drama just generally in the region with Lebanon, etc., and Israel, um, that could be a big drama because then that will start to drift into the cost of oil. You know. Um, Th- those sorts of things, mm. commodity prices, etc., and th- that's a that's a drama because um, we don't want an oil spike price because that reflects in petrol and the cost of everything. It's already high as it is. Yeah, and uh, but if it got higher, that's that, that's the you know another Typical. oil crisis. Mm. Um, so geopolitical issues in the Middle East, but also geopolitical issues in Asia. You know, it, it is a bit hot at the moment, like Taiwan, China, etc. It's all a bit hot. A lot of rhetoric going on around the place. You know, with all these. Sort of confrontations, mm. so the geopolitical issues worry me a lot. Um, but you know, we'll, that could happen any time. And uh, but it's just more likely these days than I think it has been in the past. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's just more likely. Mm-mm. So geopolitical. Um, I think the I think the big issue that we have at the moment is the length of time that interest rates are going to remain high globally. So there, there was talk that interest rates in the US should come down. Now it's now talk that now we're going to keep them up for long, higher for a longer period of time. And interest rates are actually higher that in the US than they are here. So and then there was t- talk in Australia that we should re- they should reduce it. They'll start reducing interest rates later this year. But there's now indicators coming out saying the unemployment numbers come back. So in other words, it's not growing as they expected it would, which means things are probably a little hotter here mm. in the world than in the past. Um, and uh, so that means interest rates will stay higher for longer in Australia. Those things will, I think, will crush a class of people. So in Australia, we like 31% of people in Australia have a mortgage. Sorry, start again. 33% of Australians have a mortgage. Yep. 31% of Australians are renting and thirty, nearly 31% of Australians have a property with no mortgage. They paid it off. So – That will be – more older generation. Older generation. So Middle class. And yep. they're the ones who spend all the money. So for them, high interest rates actually are good because a lot of those have got money on deposit. Yeah. And they're getting – they've they never earned so much money. Mm. Um, but the problem with that is that means the interest rates have to stay higher for longer. Yep. Those high interest rates do affect renters because whilst the renter's not borrowing money, the landlord is borrowing money exactly. and the landlord knows I can put the rent, it rents up because because there's not enough properties available. Exactly. So this dynamic, and it's not just Australia, it's global, this dynamic that exists today between the amount of money that's been withdrawn from the lending system by governments and it's been withdrawn and rapidly, so lack of liquidity together with the, uh, another uh, uh, part of the dynamic is the lack of new housing relative to population growth? Yep. In places where population is being is growing as a result of immigration, U.S., Australia, to, to U.K. Two great examples. Mm. Um, in, in immigration is growing in Australia at a crazy rate relative to what we've had in the past. In the U.S., uh, they, their immigration grew by eight million. Wow. There's people coming in over the borders. U.K. the same, and there are other, and other countries in Europe the same thing. So. Immigration population is growing not by natural means, by mm. you know, people having kids. There is a bit of that, but it's really by about poorer countries pouring into richer countries. Yes. So, so the dynamics are lack of money in the system from governments having withdrawn the money as a result of you know post COVID hangover. Um, not enough housing to house the immigration, immigration or the growth immigration. in population. Yeah. Just not enough. Yeah. And it's impossible to sort of kickstart that. I mean, there's all these formulas, we're going to do this, we're going to – but none of them will work mm. and none of them have worked so far. And I don't know what, what's going to so- solve that. And then finally, the, the last one is for that part of the cohort of people in Australia, for example, who have mortgages, the longer these high interest rates stay together with the higher cost of living but no real wage growth or no real income growth, the longer the uh, the greater the pressure is going to put on people in relation in terms of their standard of living. Yep. I don't mean that they're going to have to sell the house, but as a result of not selling the house because you know they they mostly they want to keep the house, they stop doing things that they ordinarily would do when, that they were doing during COVID when they have more money. Take kids out of sport. Take uh, they only go to the movies once every three months. They only they take less holidays. They yes. take less expensive holidays. So Australian standard of living 
will reduce. Yeah. If I assess as someone's standard living, doesn't mean that you know when you walk along the street there's fucking shit everywhere and stuff. Like that. We're not sort of putting you in some third world country. No, no. I mean the standard of living that, that people live, how they live their lives, in order, for, especially those people who have a mortgage. Well, you, you view Australia as a land of opportunity, similar to America, right? You're yeah. coming to this country, got no wage growth, you've got no supply in homes, you've got high interest rates. So let me paint this scenario for you. Like you're a 20 to 30 year old Australian, how do you get into the property market? Well. Is we we have one saving well they have a number of saving graces because it's a wonderful country and it's safe and all that sort of yes, stuff. But yes. one economic saving grace is that we have low unemployment. So there is only one way, and perhaps your parents did it, and my parents definitely did. Work a second job. Yep. yep. Work overtime. Well, I think that's a common theme these days. Yeah. You know, it's go go get another job. Yeah. Yeah. And save money. There is no way to buy property in your own name. If you, unless you team up with a mate, so you can team up with a mate, a couple of mates. You, you can you can club a property purchase. Yep. The three of you, two, three of you can do that today. Lenders will lend to three of your three incomes, as long as you have an agreement. Yep. Or if in your case you just want to borrow yourself, then you've got to save the deposit, and you've got to have the income to support the servicing. And if your current job doesn't ser uh, service the loan to buy the property that you want to buy, where you want to buy for the price you want to buy, mm. then you're going to go get another job or an additional job. Or get some side hustle or something, but you need to work harder. Old yeah. school. Yeah. This is what people did in the fifties. Yeah. Well, I totally agree with you on that, and I think that COVID is one of the main common denominators for that because people just got given all this money. Yeah. They've got given all this time and luxury, so they've gone splurging on holidays, gifts, and whatnot. And now and don't even have to go to work; you still get paid. Yeah, exactly. And now they're getting told you got to work harder to actually. That, but that's the only way. The only way mm. you have to work I think harder. People's minds they just can't accept that at the moment. Well, if they don't, mm. then they won't. To answer your question, they, they won't achieve it. Mm. If they want to achieve it, then turn your mind around. Yeah. Because and you don't have far to look. Look at your grandparents mostly, or your parents even, and see how they did it. And they did it old school, mate. At the, after the World War Two and the, during the late forties and fifties in Australia. People had two jobs, three jobs. That's where my, I, uh, I get my inspiration from, my grandfather. Correct. Yeah. So my mom ended it. Mm. They give work two or three jobs. Mm. I did it. They get, it's no big deal. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's no there's no divine right not to work and have a property at the same time. You've, uh, you've got to rub shoulders with uh, a lot of famous people in your time. Um, who has, um, take who have you taken a liking to of all those people? Uh well, I've met quite a few prime ministers um, and uh, I have to be honest, with you, uh, I have a great deal of respect for two ex-prime ministers. Well, I have respect for lots of ex-prime ministers, but two older ones. One, n not necessarily my politics, but one is Paul Keating yep. because of his enormous intellect. And I think also because of the legacy he left Australia, like he, he's the one brought in, uh, you know, the superannuation guarantee um, and a lot of other changes to the financial system that he brought in. Like he was the one who um, made it possible for pl uh, companies like Wizard to operate against the banks. So he sort of allowed, he deregulated our industry so that the others could compete with the banks, non-banks could come in. So he did a, a lot at an intellectual level. I have a huge amount of respect for him. Um, I, I, I'd also used to love the way, I just love the, his uh, oratory, the way he can speak. I have a great deal of respect the way he speaks. And, um, you know, like he can just carve people up. He's so so literate and uh, so learned and he's just brilliant. On the flip side of it, John Howard, he's just a, a great, for me, he was a great prime minister um, for our country and for a long time too, of course. So his longevity as a prime minister was uh, brilliant. Yes, it was. His ability to lead our country was brilliant. He made me proud when I saw him stand up on the world stage against other world leaders. Um, I felt proud of that's our prime minister. I Later. felt yeah, that's our guy, and uh, and I and he was only small in stature. He's still around. He's still sharp. Um, he still walks and uh, gets about his life and his business. He doesn't and he's got no, he doesn't have an axe to grind. Like he's he's not sort of dirty in the world. He's always available and accessible to talk to. He'll talk to anybody as well. So I I I, I have a great deal of respect for both those guys who I know. Um, John Howard's another Canterbury boy as well. Yeah, Canterbury yeah, yeah. And, he, and, he, and he's uh, a good young solicitor. I uh, grew up and then his, his district was Hunters Hill and he got defeated in the end, and uh, which everyone gets – everybody. Everyone gets defeated it's in the time. end. time, yeah. Everybody. 
uh, it's time to retire or you get defeated. One or two, you retire early or you get defeated and then you retire, you're forced to retire. So he, and he's, I, th- I think his humility has been like quite fantastic for me. Um, obviously Kerry Packer was a very important influence on my life. Uh, you know, he, for me, I wouldn't have been able to do what I did but for his investment in our organisation. But a lot of the encouragement for that investment in our organisation came from his son, James. So James is... He's a very generous man. But also brilliant. He's had his issues. They're public. He, he'd be the first to admit them. He has admitted them. Mm. But a lot of brilliant people do have these issues. <laughs> and uh, he was probably bipolar, you know. And, uh, you know, we know footballers are like that. Mm. Play brilliant one week, play shit the next week. But, you know, we tend – in the end, we tend only to remember their brilliance. Um, James is – Kerry had this amazing persona. James has this amazing intellectual ability. Like amazing. His memory for numbers was crazy. Mm. Um, his, his ability to dig into detail is ridiculous. Um, his ability to have a vision about what should happen in the future, what will happen in relation to media, what's going to happen in relation to gambling, what's going to happen in relation to financial services like my business. Um, if so, if it hadn't been for James's pushing and encouragement, Kerry may never even bother to invest in our business. And then as a result of Kerry investing in our business, it was Kerry's support that was amazing for me. I used to see him every month mm. um, and he was always tipping to me about what he could see. And he, what he could see was based on who he was, who he met, yep. which famous, you know, prime uh, president or whatever, you know, famous entrepreneur that he met, um, and I was sort of feeding off that through him. You know, I, I, a lot of people don't like him, but I'm not saying Trump's personality is the most likable personality from my point of view, but my God, you've got to respect the guy. Oh, hundred percent. So Trump for me was, you know, I had the opportunity to sit down and do a long, long interview in, with him in a filmed interview um, and because he owned he owned part of the, the Apprentice TV show. Yes. And, of course, he was Apprentice in the US and yes, um, yes. or the host. And Trump, the inspiration I get from Trump is that pretty much you can do anything in America, at least you can do anything you want. You can go from being a TV guy, probably develop a TV guy, to becoming the president. Mm. Now, that's one hell of a marketing job. Oh, I agree. I, I mean, totally to, get, agree. to get the whole nation. Because I have my question marks. I have my question marks, you know, the wall and all that bullshit. But then fucking. He got it. He got it. Yeah. I mean, like, it, it, what it does is shows me how you can really in America achieve anything you want. I don't yeah. know if it's nece- necessarily the case here in Australia. Mm. It's better here than it is in a lot of other countries, but it's not like America. If you're the dude in America and you put in. You can achieve just about anything you want. All right, for our next fun segment, what's in the sauce? My nickname, of course. Uh, I want to put this scenario for you. If you could invite five people to dinner, who would it be? Wow. Um, I'd like to have George Soros at my dinner. Putin. Wow. I'd like to have Putin at my dinner. Xi from China. Yep. Past um, or living? Oh, yeah. Dead, living, living, living or dead? Living or yeah. dead, sorry. Living okay. Or dead. Nostradamus. I could say and, that. <laughs> uh, and probably Socrates, um, given that um, he was very famous but ended up necking himself. But So I'd probably like to put those guys at dinner. Yep. I apologise there was no female in that group. Um, I don't have any females in my group. Either. But I tend to follow blokes more than follow females yep. for no, no other reason, just I do. Yep. Um, so I'd, I would. That, that, that's who I'd like to have there. And uh, I'd like to be just have the opportunity to ask them questions course that's why they're there just put the questions to them 100% I'm the same uh I've got Jesus as oh, of course <laughs> as one no I, I got can I yeah can I have a six because I Jesus for sure <laughs> yeah, yeah throw him in throw him in um we, I'm sure you'll find actually you know what would be good to get Jesus and Moses in and I'd like to say to Jesus Jesus did your father actually speak to Moses <laughs> I want to know the truth. You know what? We could also bring Judas back and say, was it really worth it? Fuck what you yeah. did. Fuck it. Or all. was it really his fault? <laughs> yeah. Well, are you sure there wasn't someone else? <laughs> Fuck it. All. So many questions, right? Um, I'll have Jesus. I'll have um, Pharaoh Tutankhamun. Yeah. And the first question I want to ask him is, how the fuck did you build the pyramids? Yeah, totally. Like, but, like I don't know how. I don't think they, to this day, they understand how they built the pyramids. Um, so those two. And then I'll have 
three sporting stars that I looked up to, Cristiano Ronaldo, um, Michael Jordan, and Muhammad Ali. Yeah, Muhammad Ali would be cool. Mm. What about Noah? <laughs> That's another one. Dude, Fuck. did the did it, did you actually get two of every animal? <laughs> Like, how did you work that shit out? Did you build the boat big enough? Yeah. Did it stink? And how long were you actually up in the top of the water? Like, and, and where did you where did you land? Like, where did you get out? Like, what? How did you work out? It was time to get out of this. Well, thing? you think about how big this ark must have been. Too. Totally. Oh, and he, did he build it himself? Oh, I'm sure he had a bit of help. Um, well, I love that actually. Thanks for those uh, answers. Uh, best as, best advice given to you, and by whom? Uh, best advice. And I often quote this, but the best advice ever given to me was don't be too greedy, take the money off the table. So that was Kerry Packer's advice. Um, never think there's more money in it and I'll get a better deal down the, around the road, down the road. So if the deal looks good and it's good enough and it's on the table and the deal can be done, do the deal. Take the money off the table. And he used to do that when he was gambling too. So he wouldn't think I'll go for the next hand because I can double up and I'll double up. If there was enough money on the table, take it off. See you later. Beautiful. Love that. Missed your question. Last guest was Jason Saab, and he wrote your little message. Let's uh, let's open it up. Open it up. Open it up. See what we got. Given us some of the other ones you've had, I'm getting getting nervous. (laughs) I'm uh, I'm sure Jason would have put something sensible. Well, he did have. He got a uh, a a tough question. Yeah, fuck it. Thank courtesy of Nick. Read it out for me. If you could live, if you could relive one moment or day in your life, what would it be? Recently, my father was in hospital in the palliative care division of a hospital in Sydney. Sorry to hear. And uh, he had, his body was riddled with cancer. And I had to go to Singapore for one day. So I had to go to Singapore on the Monday night. Mm. I had to do something on the Tuesday for work. Then I was due to get back on the plane Tuesday night and I would arrive back in Sydney on the Wednesday morning. And I remember saying to my father, um, Dad, can you just – you know, he was talking and he could understand everything. I said, Dad, just wait 24 hours. I said, whatever you do, I call him Pop. Pop, don't die until I get back. I said, you've got to wait. Because I felt really guilty about it and I probably could have avoided going. I could have done it by Zoom or whatever. I could have done it a different way. And he said, no, no, you go, you go. Dad always rec- always encouraged me to do my work all my whole life, no matter what. He said, no, you go, you must go. And... On the, uh, I did my work on the Tuesday. Tuesday night I was going to the airport and I get a text from my brother, he's gone. So I didn't get to see my father in his last moments. And so that's probably a good example of something that you know, I can say to Sabi. I, I regret, I really regret that. I would have changed it. I would have said, I'm not going, I'm staying and I'll do my meetings by Zoom mm. and or some other methodology and uh, I won't leave your side. I want to be there holding your hand when you take your last breath like I did when my mother passed away. That – because to me that was – wasn't so much for him, I don't think. It was more for me. I wanted to be there to watch my father take his last, last breath. I wanted to be the person holding his hand mm. in his last breath. So that's something I definitely would have changed. That's pretty powerful. That was last week. Yeah, wow. Well, two well, weeks ago. Was that two weeks ago? Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear, mate. That's all. It was all good. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that he didn't have to suffer anymore because he had was cancer everywhere. But it was more to answer the question for Sabi. It was more. It's more uh, what I'm. I, I lost just because I let work get in the way of something, and yeah. I shouldn't have done that. Yep, mate. Um, first off, my condolences to you and your family. No, thank you. And, thank you. Um, yeah, mate. Thank you for sharing that very personal story. I really appreciate it's, it. It's it's that that is fresh. Yeah, in my far head. out. It's caught me off guard. Um, well, the question caught me off guard. Yeah. Too. <laughs> uh, well, that was that was great. Thank you so much. Now you've got the honours to write the next question for our next guest. Right, and so, I don't know who the guest is. Mystery guest is. It's it? a mystery. Oh well. No, no, don't tell me. Yeah. If, if you don't tell others, don't tell yeah, me. Yeah, take your take your while to think of that question, or nah. you came prepared. <laughs> Mate, thank you so much for coming in. Before we wrap up, I've got one last question for you. Go for it. A lot of people look up to you as their mentor. Who is Mark Boris's mentor? God. Thank you very much for coming on the show. You're welcome.